All right, hi everybody. I'm Alan. Um, I'm glad I left a few minutes to let Richard's energy leave the room a little bit. Um, so I'm I'm a grad student. I'm doing a PhD at University of British Columbia, although I live here now in San Francisco. And part of my PhD is analysis of editor patterns in OpenStreetMap. Uh, so in contrast to Richard's talk, which was all full of anecdotes, mine has none. Um, this is looking at just the database itself, trying to understand a lot of the same questions that Richard is getting at, but uh, simply by looking purely at what's going on in the database without really talking to people and thinking about specific um, communities. Although, one of my main questions is thinking about how users are different, how different communities are different, um, and how different editing styles might uh, be visible in the database. So one thing that Richard didn't talk so much about, he didn't use the, the phrase maintenance, but if we're getting to the point of completeness in lots of parts of the world, we're really switching over to the sense of we're maintaining the data rather than updating it or creating it the first time. Um, Kronvonica thinks a flaw in the human character is that everybody wants to build and nobody wants to do maintenance. I think we would disagree with that. I think we know well enough from looking at projects like OpenStreetMap and Wikipedia that there's enough people in the world who get off on maintenance, um, enough people to make a project like OpenStreetMap work. But who are those people? Are they the same people that create the data to begin with? Or are those trailblazers people who drop off after they filled in the map and then it's a different personality type or a different group of people who will do that maintenance later? We don't really know. We have a lot of anecdotal evidence about what we think happens in a community or what we think happens with individual users. But what I'm going to try to do, and this is really work in progress, is to try to see can we actually see? Are they the same people? Are they different people? So I'm coming from the academic uh, context and there's been some work on OpenStreetMap in academia and a lot of, a lot of uh, blurred boundaries between people who are working somewhat in academia and somewhat within OpenStreetMap. So there's been a lot of great research coming out of the OSM community as well. Um, the first research that was really happening was looking at completeness, looking at quality measures. Uh, Mookie Hackley did some of the best, really interesting early work on OpenStreetMap, looking at changes in time, so from March in 2008 to October 2009, how much uh, OpenStreetMap caught up and in many ways surpassed the Ordnance Survey coverage of England in this case. But that really is looking at Every, every kind of edit is the same, and it's one continuous phase of growth. Whereas more recent research, this is from a, a group uh, led by Kokoran um, in Ireland, they're looking at what are these really different phases of filling in the map. So they are classifying the edits into this first phase called exploration, so maybe filling in the major roads. And then you'll have a densification phase where you start to fill in the neighborhood roads in between um, primary roads, for example. So I'm, I'm taking some inspiration from their work, but I'm trying to get a little bit further because I think we could think of densification a little bit as still building the map. It's still exploring the unknown spots on the map, the blank spots on the map. It's not quite the same thing as maintaining it. And finally, I'm also really inspired by some of this recent work by Pascal Nice, who is both sort of within the OSM community and within the academic world as well, looking at how different parts of the world are different. Um, we haven't really seen enough uh, comparative studies between different communities to see how they differ, how they grew differently. Um, and in the imports discussion yesterday, there was even some talk about how could we even do A-B testing between different towns or different countries to see what what style of tools or what style of import um, has a certain effect on a community or not. So this, this paper is open access, just came out a few weeks ago, I think. And they're finding, one of their findings here is that, is that the density of contribution correlates fairly well with uh, per capita income in different cities, but there's clearly some range that is going off of that trend line. But the one question also that none of those studies were answering was the big the elephant in the room, the question of imports. And here, if we're the OSM US community, that is something that we have to think about all the time. So here's the a chart that we've probably all seen before. 
This is nodes and ways and relations over time in the database. And we can see that gigantic spike in mid-2007, where we saw a, little, a continuous growth before that. We see a continuous sort of exponential growth after that. But when the Tiger data got imported into the US, it was massive um, compared to what was already out there around the world. This is like worldwide um, nodes. So suddenly, Tiger made the US far ahead of anyone else, but it didn't really help us continue that momentum after that point. So I'm taking some inspiration from uh, Wikipedia research and Wikipedia terminology, this idea of a wiki gardener. And people have used the phrase gardener or gardening in, in OSM for a while. Um, so that's not really new to apply it here. But just to talk about what a wiki gardener is, is a wiki gardener is someone who uh, cleans up grammar or cleans up links in a wiki. Basically keeps it usable, keeps it working, keeps it slick and functional, but it's certainly not the same kind of glamorous, sexy job as like writing an article to begin with. It's kind of work that no one really notices or no one really sees. And we're lucky that enough people find it fun to do that, or else we would have to pay people to keep editing Wikipedia to keep it up to um, readable standards, because eventually all the links would break and the grammar would be all inconsistent and so on. Now, I'm talking in terms of wiki gardeners, like there's specific people who are gardeners, but this is also something that is a bit more of a continuum, that you can garden sometimes, but that doesn't mean you're always a, a wiki gardener. Um, so we can think of it as an action that someone does, but also there's gonna be some people who are more often than not gardening and more often than not adding other kinds of content. So really what I'm trying to get at here is obviously not all users are the same. We've talked about power users versus the 95% who are you know, the average users. Um, but more importantly, I'm trying to find out like not all edits are the same. So we might be creating a new road in the unknown, or we might be adding a post box next to a road. Those are actions that feel really different, and different personalities might be interested in doing that, or different time in the database might uh, be more amenable to that kind of edit versus another. And of course, not all places are not the same. So we need to be comparing different parts of the world to see how these patterns are different. And if there are more gardeners at a certain time or a certain place than in other times and places. So I was trying to figure out a way to actually get some kind of numerical way of looking at this gardener versus non-gardener, or a gardener versus maybe a map explorer is the kind of term that I'm using to contrast a gardener. Um, because we need some way to like, look at the database and say, does this correspond or not correspond with our assumptions about how communities form and how users edit the map? So I began with the whole history dump, and I cut it off at, at June 2012 because I wanted to avoid all of the redactions and all of the license change. I'm really more interested in how these communities grew. Um, a lot of different kinds of edits occurred during the redaction and remapping process. Super interesting questions to, to look at, but it would just be too complicated to look at it in this first phase of my analysis. Maybe I'll come back and try to see what kinds of remapping exploration was being done in the map. I'm looking at a few study areas. So I'm picking out urban areas mainly um, uh, metropolitan scale, and picking a few in Europe, a few in North America, a few uh, elsewhere around the world, because I'm so interested in that question of the imports versus non-imports, I'm mainly trying to compare Europe versus North America, but I want to expand this analysis and start looking at more cities around the world as well. To make my job easier, I'm only looking at nodes. I'm just like ignoring ways, I'm ignoring relations. I just want to see who edited nodes at certain times, um, who modified nodes, uh, were there other nodes nearby when they did that. So to do my analysis, I'm overlaying a one kilometer grid over each of these urban areas. And within, for each username, I'm seeing um, how many of their edits to nodes in that extracted part of the database, how many of those edits occurred in a grid square where no one else had mapped there before. So this is my indication of this is the map explorer. They're, they're they're filling in those blank spots on the map, which is this metaphor that I'm going to keep using. Um, so I'm looking at the number of total edits that they've made. And again, this is just raw number of edited nodes, so I'm not looking at chain sets, chain sets or anything like that. I'm looking at the number of 
version one edits, so those are new features that they're adding, even though those might be a post box right next to another um, road, or it might be new nodes that are just simply drawing in the, the vertices of a building that was already represented in the database. So the main thing I'm trying to look at is that number of edits and blank spots on the map. So those are the new nodes that are created in a grid square where nothing was there before. I'm also looking at what was the first date I have recorded for this um, editor anywhere in my extract. So are those the early mappers or they, do they come to the project later? Looking at the total number of days editing, so are they coming to the database a lot? Are they here over a long period of time or did they just show up for a day and not recur? Um, and then the mean editing date. So of all of the dates that your edits are present in my extract, um, how many nodes did you edit on each of those dates? I average all that together, so I get a sense of whether, even though maybe you edited uh, the very early days, maybe you never came back until 2012, and then you did a whole lot of mapping then. My mean editing date would show that you are more a later mapper than an earlier mapper. So that controls for the fact that that first editing date may not necessarily indicate um, what I'm looking for. And then the other thing to keep in mind is that I'm only counting a user's activity in each of these study areas. So if I pick out a, a city, and maybe you're a power user in some other city, but you've only dabbled in this one and made two or three edits in this city, I'm going to not count you as a power user. I'm only going to look at those three edits you made in the city. So these are some animated GIFs just to give a little bit of context of the historical evolution of some of my case studies. You've probably seen these before. Um, this is the great OSM history renderer tool. So, London is one of my case studies. You'll see that it fills in really fast. So the map is pretty much done by 2008, 2009. Mostly you see that, that network of major roads come in and then the neighborhoods fill in, but it doesn't seem to correspond quite as much as the Corcoran model of you build a network and then you fill in the neighborhoods. It looks like people are mapping their neighborhoods first and then some of the connecting roads in between. As a complete contrast, let's look at an American city where we see basically nothing and then suddenly tiger import and then we see a lot of fidgeting with the map for years after that. So we still see a lot of gardening going on. People are putting effort into this map for sure, but it's a huge difference in terms of watching this over time versus London. And then in Canada, we have a bit of a weird in-between um, state where we have geo-based data, which is like tiger data. It's free government data that is a nice road network of the world to get started with. But the license was not public domain. It was unclear whether we could use that, that geo-based data. So in Canada, people decided we're not going to wait to figure out this license. We're going to start mapping ourselves. And then, Eventually, when things are half mapped, we realize, okay, we can import the geo-based data, but it comes in in a patchwork. It comes in with little imports at a time, trying to fit it into places where people have not contributed a lot of work on their own. So you see around 2009, these chunks start coming in. But up to that point, it grew more naturally, more of the style of the London map, but starting a little bit later and not quite as dense as quickly as London, for sure. So the, looking at, say, the UK model as an example of a map built from scratch, um, the American model is a map where we have the tiger import and a lot of gardening that happened afterward, and a Canadian model kind of falls somewhere in between. I'm sure there's other places around the world that we could find similar um, cases like that. So here's an example of central London. So my case study is larger. I tried to get the entire uh, metropolitan area but zoomed in on central London, here are all of the ways that have ever been present in London. So the thickness of these lines is not showing importance of any feature, it just shows that if it's thicker and darker, that means it's been edited a lot of times. Um, so generally the more important features have been edited more often, but that doesn't necessarily um, always hold true. So it's this interesting kind of ghostly map of the, of um, of London and there's anything that was ever there and deleted right away still shows up in my database. So that was an edit that occurred at some point in history, so I'll be looking at those. 
So if I overlay my one kilometer grid like this, and then this is just an example, those are those nodes that I picked out where um, those are the ones that, that were first mapped in each of those grid cells. Okay, so what does this actually look like? Now that I've gone through and I've found all those blank spot edits, those mapping the unknown, and I've linked those to all the users that created those, here's what we get when we um, draw a scatter plot of each of these dots is one user who at, at some point edited in London. The size of the dot shows how many days active they were in the database. So if you're active a lot, you, you're present several days, your dot is larger. Um, and then along the bottom axis going to the right, that's your total number of nodes that you've ever touched in the database. Um, so some of the power users here have touched up to 100,000 nodes um, up to mid-2012. The vertical axis is those number of blank spots edits, so the number of places you've mapped into the unknown. So obviously, as we would expect, um, there's this line kind of going from the middle, from the lower left, up to the right, that you can't get above that because it's impossible to have more blank spot edits than total edits. So you'll never see anything in the upper left quadrant, um, or the upper left, actually, half of this. Um, and both of these are logarithmic scales. So those power users are really way off the chart. I had to use a logarithmic scale to bring them back in at all. Um, so here's definitely we're seeing that 5% that of the people are doing by far the bulk of the work. But we also see in London, along the bottom line, those are all a lot of people who have never gotten to map any blank spots because they joined the project after the grid had basically been filled in. Um, and because these are logarithmic scales where it says one down there, that actually means zero. You have to do a little bit of a tweak to the math or, or your calculations go crazy when you try to do a logarithm of zero. So all along the bottom, those are definitely people who never got to really be those explorers, at least the way I'm defining it. Here's the same chart for the Bay Area. And we see definitely a lot of the editors are forced down and to the right, meaning that they don't have as many of those blank spot edits. And what we see actually up there at the top, upper right, some, um, those are the user accounts associated with the Tiger imports. So they're very small, meaning they were only active in the database for a few days to import the Tiger data for the Bay Area. But they're way up there because they are responsible for most of those blank spot edits. They filled in the map. Um, and they're also responsible for a lot of total nodes, too. So that's why they're way up in the corner, but they're so small. Those are not humans, those are import data. Seattle is a case showing a pretty similar um, distribution. Vancouver is sort of in between. So we have an import account, pretty high up there, but we also see that there are more users who are kind of higher up on the chart, so they got to do more of that that trailblazing editing, um, even though there's still one import account that accounts for most of it. And a few examples, like a city that's not in um, Europe or North America, Cairo, uh, is still in the early phases of being mapped. We see very few uh, users in the bottom right, meaning that most editors in Cairo have a large percentage of their edits were mapping the unknown. So everyone is still getting a chance to fill in those blank spots on the map. Um, over time, of course, we'll see a lot of more gardening. We'll see these users move down and to the right. But right now, it's still the early days in a place like Cairo. Obviously, the grid size that I'm choosing um, will have a huge effect on this. It'll be affected by not only the structure of the city, like where the major roads are, what the neighborhood roads are, um, but of course, the smaller the grid I make, the more, th more edits I will classify as blank spots. Um, I'm still experimenting with what is the, the best scale, and possibly the scale will be dependent on studying different cities. Uh, so if I use a smaller grid on London, we see obviously a lot more of those users who were along that bottom line move up into the scatter plot because they, they now are classified as making those blank spot edits that before they, they were not because the grid is smaller. Here's Vancouver, so obviously North American City has a different kind of street grid. Um, and we're more likely to be finding nodes that are even between blocks if I go down to a small enough scale. 
same pattern of more users are, are showing up there. And also, if I look at a city like Manchester, which has the same population roughly as Vancouver, so they're both roughly around 2 million people, but so much smaller in terms of area that in, on the left, the one kilometer grid may not even make sense for some place like Manchester because there's so few grid squares, um, basically it doesn't take very long before everything gets completely mapped according to my, my grid analysis. And so we can do all current kinds of other, other views of this. So I'm still trying to figure out what are the best ways to, to look for these different types of users, um, different classifications of users um, using these stats that I can produce now. So if we look at version one edits going up and total edit nodes on the right. So if we're not looking at that blank spot indication anymore, we're simply looking at new features versus modified features. We see that um, we're almost all along that vertical with sort of upper right line. So most people's edits are version one node edits. But we do see a few who are still down um, into uh, along the bottom and to the right, so those are people who are only really modifying things. They're not adding anything new. And sometimes those, those uh, users that are along that bottom line, most of those are bots. So in this case, we see one um, down along the bottom all the way at the right. It's, it's modifying a lot of nodes, creating a lot of nodes, but none of them are um, version one nodes, according to this chart. As we would expect, so now if I'm putting the number of blank spot edits along, uh, along the upper axis and the first editing date along the bottom, we would, as we'd expect, people who have joined the project early are the ones who get to do that exploring. So up to the right, those are the people who joined in 2006 in London. They're also, of course, creating a lot of, of those blank spots. They're mapping a lot of the unknown, as we would expect. But we don't see that same kind of pattern in US cities because we have one little user way up there, in the upper left, that is that tiger import that, that fills in most of the blank spots. And then all the people who arrive later have less of those blank areas to fill in. And then if I look at the weighted mean, so this is again what your, the, your average date of contribution is. So what we see in London, actually, is that those power users who were there at the early days, who mapped the unknown, filled in the map, their mean date is about in the middle of, of history, as far as OSM is concerned. So their average date is around 2009. So they've been active from the beginning, 2006, and still as active today, 2012 and 13. So what we're seeing is that they're not dropping off. They're, they're not like getting bored after they've mapped the unknown. They are sticking around, and they are continuing to edit. But then we can also definitely see in places like Vancouver, where those power users, the ones who are here on a lot of days doing a lot of edits, they're all shifted to the right. This is a sign of a community that is a little bit younger, that has not been as active as early as London. Things we know, but we now have a way of seeing how different cities fall into these different um, ways of viewing them. So obviously, I want this to be useful as a way of understanding what's going on in the community, but I want it to be useful to the community as well. So if any feedback you guys have on, is this meaningful to you as OpenStreetMappers? Is this meaningful to you um, as community organizers within OpenStreetMap? Are there other ways that I should be looking at the data? I'm definitely open to those kind of um, suggestions. Certainly, there's more that I want to do in terms of, right now, I'm looking at a very high standard for being a map explorer. So being the first one in every kilo square kilometer is a very high bar to reach. Um, there's got to be other ways that I can measure who are sort of exploring in some way. So maybe the first people who are adding addresses, that's a different kind of exploring in some sense, or the first people who are adding buildings. Um, I can look at those kind of indicators too and see one person's exploring may represent someone else's sense of gardening. Um, but that's all I have for right now, so I don't know if I have much time for questions, but I'd love to talk with any of you either right now or afterward. One question from Martin. Yeah, um, so um, lovely statistics, uh, they overlap with some of the stuff that I was um, going to say as well. Mm -hmm. So 
So Martin is asking, um, am I looking at the distribution of mappers versus the quality of data? However I define that, yeah. Um, and no, I'm not, at least not yet. Uh, because there's been sort of enough, at least academic research and also within the community in terms of uh, quality, I'm trying to avoid those questions and I may at some point kind of link my work to those other studies. Um, also, I think even more important thing that I'm avoiding is what is the quality of a community too. Um, because I'm, get, I'm trying to get at these questions of what, what are the right circumstances to have a healthy long-running community, but I don't yet know how to answer that, how to say what is the sign this, this community is healthy. Um, but I would like to go there. So I think there's one way back there. Clean up by local mappers? Um, yeah, I mean, I would, that's another thing I would like to do is to be able to look at who is local and who is not. I mean, that's certainly, certainly one thing that um, would be relatively easy to do. I could just, for every user that's present in each case study, every study area, I could then count how many edits you made within that and then how many you made outside of that. Um, that would be really interesting. Yeah. Yeah, and, and to look even for cleanup after a specific event or a specific import, um, I would like to be able to look over time and, and say, well, we know, that, we know where tiger imports happen, but we can say, here's where the earthquake in Haiti happened and see what happened after that, or here's where a smaller import occurred. Was there a sudden change from maybe everyone switched to like gardening for a little while to get that up to date? Yeah. Yeah, Im different changes in energy, even changes in tools. Like, what is the effect of ID going to be? What, would I even be able to see that in t terms of these numbers? Like, if you have a significantly different editor, maybe people will edit in different ways. Um, here. Yeah, uh, the question is about context in particular. Um, and I think that's very important for what I'm trying to get at here because the, the non-quantitative parts of my dissertation are thinking about what, what does it mean to, to create place in virtual space? You know, what is, it, what is the, the sense of ownership people might have over their online representation of their town in, in relation to what they feel about their physical space? Um, there's, and I can start to look at that by looking maybe more at the tags and more at the temporal context of what happened in each of these edits, but I'm not looking at that yet. I don't know how much more time I have. There's one over here. Yeah, um, the mean edit date, yeah, d does not catch whether power users have slowed down or sped up. Um, what I would, one way that might make this chart just far too messy would be to put a box plot for each of these, uh, each of these uh, editors so that you could see the length of time. You say most of their edits were occurring here, but then they have some outlier edits that occurred a year later. Um, so being able to look at whether this mean date really tells us something um, would, be, would be interesting. Because um, if we look at the, those London ones, they're really in the center of the time frame, so they are not likely to be slowing down. We would see them shifted uh, a little bit to the left if they were slowing down today. Um, but yeah, we're losing a lot of information by simplifying it to that one number, for sure. Yeah. Well, the, the question is whether these dynamics can be generalized to volunteer geographic information more broadly or even to use GC, user-generated 
user-generated content more broadly. Um, and I'm certainly bringing this idea from Wikipedia, which is completely non-geographic. Um, but I think the being able to put this the spatial lens onto it um, is is something that is certainly changing how I think about it for uh, geographic data in particular. The thing is, very few VGIs, or volunteer geographic information projects, um, have the same level of editing that OpenStreetMap has. So many of them are just, you contribute once and then you're gone. Or you contribute a million times, but you're not modifying anything you've contributed. So that's something that makes OpenStreetMap really unique, is like the level of, uh, of editing and re-editing and maintaining that goes on, and that we're all like committed to this, keeping this project functional forever. It's not just a snapshot necessarily of how things were at one time. So um, very, I think very few other VGI projects would have the same extent of gardening, but I would like to make those kind of comparisons eventually. Yeah. Thanks.